Grace Bible Fellowship to our morning worship, but to our regulars. And I saw some new faces walk in this morning, so to any of our visitors this morning, we welcome you with open arms as well. May God richly bless us as we worship Him together this morning. All right, a couple of things to, well, the beautiful flowers, first of all, are from the funeral of Paul to Leonard. Paul, of course, is the, the father of Glenn to Leonard. Of course, our prayers are with the to Leonard family during this difficult time. And then another, <laughs> then another prayer request. Uh, many of you know that Mary Lambers has struggled with cancer on and off for many years, and cancer has returned, and she's going to start chemo on Wednesday. And you, you know somebody who's gone through that. It's another difficult time coming in for her. So please add Mary Lambers to your prayers as well. And uh, guys, I want to remind you once again of the No Regrets sign-up sheet. The list is starting to grow. That's good. And we're going February 4th. I need to have a list of, uh, I think uh, Kyle told me the second week of November, but I'll, I'll update you as time goes on. But just get your name on that list if you're interested in going along to Elmwood Church with us. And we, we do have sort of a, a time frame now on the building next door. We found out that the occupants in there are going to be leaving Sometime in October, maybe about the third week of October, is that about right? Third week of Third or fourth week of October. So that if you just pray that God will give us the resources we need to get the project done, and then everything will go smoothly. So we're looking forward to that. One thing we talked about at our last meeting was uh, the fact that we need to, we could have some type of a book exchange going on. Maybe you're familiar with this. Sometimes communities have this where somebody will set out a so a small bookcase or a box on the curb, and people in the community will just put books in there and take books out as you need. Well, wouldn't it be great if we had one of those here? So if you have a small, tiny little bookcase, or maybe even some kind of a decorative box with a couple of shelves in that we could use for a book exchange, that'd be very much appreciated. We'd like to set that up somewhere in our, our fellowship area and just uh, let it happen. So if you have some kind of bookcase, let me know. We'll get that started. And I've been finding recently that there's still some people that are not on the Grace Bible Fellowship email list. So if you're not on the list, just get me your email address so you can get the week weekly YouTube uh, video and the other things that we communicate to the church body through email. All right. Anything else needs to be brought up today? Deb. Yes, Deb. Uh, women's Bible study Tuesday night, 6 o'clock for your church. 6 o'clock Tuesday. Women's study. Okay. And then, yes, Pastor. I the calling actually that the girl's mother is likely going to pass away. Okay, if you didn't hear that in the back, any girl's mother is ill and is not so well, is likely going to pass away soon, so add her to your prayer list as well. Anything else? Let's stand in for prayer. It's okay. Yeah. Father God, we are here for you and for you alone. We, we ask you to, as we give you thanks for this day, first of all, thank you for this day, thank you for these people, thank you for this church, and thank you for the word that we are going to hear today. We ask you at this time to, to quiet our minds. There's so many things that are going on that cause us to, to think about other things and for our minds to wander. Help us to stay focused on you alone. And we ask that your Holy Spirit be with us, that you'll inspire us through your word today. And we pray for our pastor that your word may flow through him and we can hear your truth and give us the courage to be obedient to your word as we leave here today. Father God, would your Holy Spirit bless us on this day. It's in the name of our loving Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Greet your brothers and sisters in the name of Christ this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning.
26. Pray that the Holy Spirit will fill you today with His power to meet you.
filled with joy with the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that you would pour out your witness upon us by your word today, that we would be encouraged in it, that we would be blessed by it, that we would be strengthened by it, so that we have greater zeal to serve you and to honor your name. We pray, Lord, for members of your church today to our in a time of trial and difficulty. We pray for Ani, Lord, as she is visiting her sister so far away. As she uh, draws close to death, I pray that she would be able to spend some good time with her sister. Pray that you give her sister some clarity of thought so that they can uh, remember and enjoy your good gifts on this earth. And Lord, we pray that you'd be with uh, Glenn and Gloria Slender and the Slender family as they they grieve the passing of Glenn's father. We pray that you would assure them of the comfort that comes as a believer. For Lord, we don't grieve as those in the world grieve. We have no Savior and no hope. But we, uh, we grieve differently, Lord. We feel the pain of loss, but we have hope that is eternal, that is placed in our hearts. And we pray that that would well up in them. We pray that that is, she is at her mother's side, also uh, nearing death. We pray that you would give Daddy strength and comfort as she ministers to her mother at this time. Lord, we do uh, lift up Mary Lammers once again. She's gone through so many trials, and her name has been on our lips many, many times in prayer over the years. We pray that you would bless her, bless her family as they walk through these familiar waters once more. We pray that you would uh, minister to the entire family, Lord, in this time. God, we ask that you would bless our church as we anticipate uh, expansion with the back wall coming down and our sanctuary getting larger. We're thankful for that provision. We're thankful, Lord, that only you can organize such things, that the business next door would move when we need to expand, that you go before us and that you level the mountains and that you go before us and cut down the iron bars and uproot the brass gates so that we might know that you are the one that does the ministry power. That it's not of our flesh and blood, not of our strength or of our will, but of you. Help us to depend on you daily. Help us to go to you faithfully in your word and prayer each day. We pray a special prayer to you, Lord, on our young families as they raise children. That you would give them the conviction to uh, rise up in the morning with your word on their lips. That their children would see them walk in the way and speak of you along the way. That their children would see your power in them as they faithfully follow you. And that the young people of our church would have that model at home and in our church so that they would come to know you in early days. And Lord, we pray that you would have anointing on the preaching of your word today. That we would receive it in all of its power and that with all that it says, that you would speak to each of our hearts a word of conviction to draw us closer to you. We pray all these things in the name of our wondrous Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This time we have the opportunity to bring our tithes and offerings before the Lord. And we pray that as we do so, that you would do so in the your <coughs>
6, 30 through 44. I, I just want to give you uh, a word of personal preference here. I know a lot of you have gone to electronic idols. And, and you turn digital into the text, and it's still the word of God. It doesn't diminish its power in any way. But there is a limitation to some of those versions in that you can't put your notes. I had a conversation yesterday with someone who is, uh, works in a conservatory. And what she does is she restores books, she restores Bibles. And uh, these people bring these Bibles that they've used for years, and she goes through them and sees some of their notations, some of their insights. And as a pastor who does people's funerals, one of the things that I usually ask for is the person's Bible. I open it up, and sometimes I'll even stand it on end like this and see where it opens. And it, I, I usually can find one of their favorite texts or their notes or, or some clippings in it that is dear to them. And you get a little bit more familiar with the book by turning the pages, knowing where it's located instead of just putting the text in it and it pops up. So just a little encouragement for you to use your own Bibles, bring your Bibles to church, or they are provided for you if you don't have them. So our text this morning comes from Mark chapter 6. Just, just a word about Mark chapter 6 before we get to the text where Jesus feeds the 5,000. This section of the Word of God is very much focusing on the people who are lost. It's, it's re reaffirmed over and over again. People that don't have faith, people that are lost. The, the chapter begins with Jesus going to his hometown where there are not all miracles performed because the people were a little faith. And then, as the vision of our church being disciples who lead other people to Christ and disciple others, he's taking his disciples along with them everywhere he goes. And he's modeling what he's doing. And then he sends them out. Now imagine what it would be like to be one of Jesus' disciples. It's great as long as you're sitting under his teaching, and he's doing all the work, and then he says, okay, now you go up and do the same. Your heart kind of comes up in your throat, and you say, well, what am I going to say? And he says, don't worry about what you're going to say. God will supply. Okay. okay. Have you ever felt ill-equipped to serve God in something? And so he sends them out, and now he's, they're, they're coming back, and they've done some pretty incredible stuff. In the name of Jesus, they have healed people. By anointing oil, they have healed the sick and the lame, and now they're coming back to report that all that he does. In the meantime, of all this going on, John the Baptist, who is bold in proclaiming the word to a political leader, has literally been decapitated for his service to God. And so the disciples are coming to Jesus in awe of what they're doing, and yet have great fear of what might happen to them if they keep doing this. Okay, so they come back to Jesus to give the report, and that takes us to verse 30. Mark chapter 6, beginning at verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. Then because so many people were coming and going that they didn't have, even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourself to a quiet place and get some rest. Okay, that's, I, I'd like to pause right there for a moment. In this little section, we have a great maxim of life. There's a pattern in this text for what discipleship is supposed to look like. It amazes me sometimes I get together with with pastors, people that have gone to seminary and have conversations of what discipleship is supposed to look like. Well, it looks very simple. You see what Jesus did and you pattern yourself after it. Jesus taught the disciples. He modeled for them what they were to do. That he sent them out and then they came back and they gave a report and then they debriefed. And this was their normal pattern of discipleship. And that also is our normal pattern of discipleship. If you don't know how to disciple, you do this. You follow Jesus. You follow his example. You lead other people. You pass on that teaching. And you, you send them out there. Say, okay, now you go do this. Go practice leading someone to Jesus. Share the gospel with someone this week. And they come back and they give a report of how they did. Well, I kind of fell on my face. And that's it. And you say, okay, let me need to do this a little bit different. There are times when the disciples came back and they said, yeah, but... 
We tried to cast out this demon and it didn't work. You see, the, the crucible of teaching comes in the midst of life, not just in a classroom where you just add a whole bunch of knowledge and then someday do something for God. It's very active learning. This also is the pattern of parenting as well. You teach, you model, you send out. God gave us children to raise up to let them go, release them. Can I hear any men in there? That you send them, intending them to walk in their own faith, and they come back and they, they give a report, and then you talk. And even as they're adults, you have this ongoing relationship that's really beautiful. So I didn't want you to miss that. So the disciples come back from this busy, busy, busy life they're leading, partially traumatized from the death of John the Baptist, and they didn't even get a chance to eat. And you may have had moments like that in life where it's so busy that you don't even have a chance to eat. Jesus says, come with me by yourself to a quiet place, yet some rest. Friends, it's not God's intention that we burn out. And this is a great pattern for what a quiet time is with the Lord. It's said so many times that we kind of get blue in the face saying it, that we need to read God's Word, we need to pray. We need to be built up as believers. We get poured out, we get exhausted ministering to other people. And in this case, as they're ministering to people, when you minister to people, people come to you. People with needs come to you. This text describes Jesus doing this miraculous things, and the people are clamoring all the time, give me your time, give me your time, give me your time, give me the power, give me the power. I want, I want, I want. And he says, okay, let's, let's go away. Come with me to a quiet place and get some rest. So they attempt to do that. They get in a boat, they go across, but the people run around the lake and meet them there, and all those people with needs are there again. Now, I, I want to just skip a little bit forward in this text, even before I read it, and tell you that after this, verse 45, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into a boat and go ahead of them to Bethesda, while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. If you do not pursue quiet time, pursue rest, put it into your schedule and make rest happen, you will just constantly be busy, 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 and burnt out. Extremely important principle that Jesus models for his disciples and leads them in it. We need it desperately. The Lord does not intend for us to burn out. The elements, Jesus says, come with me. It's not just escape into the woods, you know, go deer hunting or something and think, well, okay, yeah, it's a rest from your daily routine, but you're not with him necessarily. So you have to be intentional, be with Jesus, that it's by yourself, not going on a retreat with a bunch of people. We have to spend this time with the Lord by ourselves. In a quiet place. The quiet place here in the Greek means remote. It means you've got to get away. You've got to get to a place where it's quiet, where the world is not going to interrupt. It was interesting, I did a, a wedding yesterday in the afternoon, and uh, during the service, somebody's cell phone went off. And everybody was kind of going like that, and I was trying to keep focus on the, I was in the message part of it, and so I was trying to keep focus on the message, and that phone kept ringing, and ringing, and ringing. And everybody stayed really still. No one went for their phone, so no one could tell who it was. It sounded like it was in someone's purse or in their pocket or something like that. And everybody kind of was going like this. Even technologically. Unplugged. It's so difficult in this age with technology. We're constantly <coughs> listening to something, constantly on the tech stuff, talking on the phone. We're not even present with other people half the time. So turn off the stuff, get quiet with Jesus to a solitary place, and rest. How many of you could acknowledge today that you could use a little bit of rest with the Lord? Raise your hand. Give testimony of the truth. 
we need to be obedient to this. Pursue the quiet time. Now, verse 32, so they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place, but, but many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw the large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. He had compassion on them. Now, I'm, this week I was trying to walk in this text in the disciples' shoes. They're, they're busy, 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 doing one thing after another, meeting people. Jesus says, go to a solitary place. You get, you, you're, you're rowing the boat or working the boat to get to the other side of the lake. They, they actually went from east to west. They were going against the prevailing winds, so they were probably doing a little bit of this. They get over to that other point, and a bunch of people are waiting for them. Now, how, where would your mind go at that moment? Irritation? Do you get to that point when you have already been poured out, you're at your limit, and then something else comes that requires you to minister, or to do for someone else again because people are like me? Jesus didn't show any irritation. Uh, Jesus was not annoyed. <coughs> But I have to think, at some point, the disciples are saying, well, like, when is this going to end? I mean, isn't there a time and place for everything? They probably started quoting scripture somewhere. But Jesus saw the crowds, and he had compassion on them. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Now, Jesus is going to do two things here. He's going to teach them, which is his first response to meet a need. And the second thing is he's going to feed them when that need arises. But he has compassion on them because they're like sheep without a shepherd. Now, how would you identify people like a sheep if you yourself were not a shepherd? Jesus is the good shepherd. When we look in the Old Testament and teachings about sheep and shepherding, over and over again, there's some things that come out about shepherding and sheep. In Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 5, it says that they were scattered and they became food for the beasts. Now we've all seen the National Geographic when you're not in a tight group and you kind of wander off by your own how you're kind of a sitting duck for a lion or a group of hyenas or something like that. You're targeted. Jesus knows that when you are walking without a shepherd and you're off by yourself, you are put in danger. Now friends, when we see people, oftentimes we see their clothing, we see how well fed they are, whether they're well kept or not, if they have a decent job, they drive a nice car, they live in a house, they, it's, it appears by all external appearances that life is good for them. But let me tell you, if they do not have Jesus, they can be very religious, they can go to church, if they don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, they are like a songbird that cannot sing in a cage. They don't have a song to sing. They are not free. They are bound. In addition to that, they are in a very dangerous place. They're sitting ducks. Again, in Ezekiel chapter 34, 23 through 25, he describes that, that they are vulnerable to beasts and that this is a danger to the sheep. So this, this dangerous setting is something that we have to drill into our mind. If we are a follower of Jesus, we need to be looking for people who are in danger. And they are all around us. In Numbers 27, 17, it speaks of the sheep and the shepherd that, that leading them out bringing them out and leading them out and bring them in instead of being scattered. Leading them out, bring them in. That's what happens when you have a good shepherd. You get let out and you get brought back in. And as you go, you're in a group and many of us know Psalm 23, you're led to green pastures where you can take sustenance and gain strength. You're led beside the still waters where you can be refreshed. You have someone watching over you in, in difficulty so that you can be corrected and encouraged and know that you're counted. 
And, and so we have this imagery of a shepherd here looking at a group of people who are like a scattered flock that don't have a shepherd. They cannot respond to his voice because they don't have a shepherd. Now, I want you to think about the days in which Jesus was teaching. Was there a shortage in any way of spiritual leaders? Of people who are identified as technically spiritual leaders in the religious community of Jesus? There were formerly known all kinds of spiritual leaders. Many teachers, they had the Sanhedrin, they had... They had the Pharisees, and they had the Sadducees, and they had the Essenes, and there were plenty of spiritual leaders in Jesus' day. Yet, the people that he saw were scattered like sheep without a shepherd. Friends, I believe there's a great parallel in our day to this. There are many, many religious people. They go to church. They, one of my first experiences in a church like this was when I, I left home, I went off to college, and I applied to be a youth pastor at a church that was on the campus that, that I went to. I applied to be the youth pastor. I was 18 years old, and they hired me. I couldn't believe it, but they did. They hired me. I was the youth pastor of their church. The first, I didn't even worship with them yet. I, I went and I worshiped with them that week, and I heard an Old Testament reading. I heard a New Testament reading and a message about how we are supposed to be good. And week after week after week, it was be good. Be good. Be good. Be good to people. Love people. Accept people. Be good to people. There was no truth of God's word in the gospel there. And so at 18 years old, I became a missionary in a church working with the youth to share the gospel with kids that did not grow up with it. And I was, that was my introduction to a theology that does not see God's word as authoritative and does not have the gospel. Friends, there are many people who you know who identify themselves as Christian because they attend a church. But they are like sheep without a shepherd. They are in great danger. In fact, Many people who are who identify themselves as Christian are in greater danger than someone is a complete pagan. They know they're pagan. And when presented with the gospel, they know that if they don't come to this, the spirit conviction that they need to accept Jesus to be saved because there's nothing good they've ever done. Many times it's easier for them to receive the gospel than it is somebody that thinks they're already saved. What greater deception could there be on earth than to think that you are saved and be lost for eternity. Think about that. You go through life with this false confidence and you're pictured among those who, like Jesus told the parable, that come to Jesus in that great day. And they say, Lord, Lord, and he says, get away from me, you evildoer. I never knew you. <coughs> and this is how Jesus sees the crowd. Verse 35. By this time it was late in the day. So his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said. Uh, which really wasn't news to Jesus. See, Jesus knew that it was a remote place already. But they, they seemed to need to inform him of the circumstances as if he didn't notice that this was a remote place. And it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to surrounding countryside and villages to buy themselves something to eat. So as the day is progressing, the disciples are, are hearing people maybe murmur a little bit, maybe their stomach was starting to growl a bit, and people are getting hungry, and it's like, it's supper time. Sort of like church when the pastor preaches a little off, and you didn't really get, have time to eat breakfast this morning, because you, you, know, you had to get to church and you are running a little late anyway. And the pastor preached along and your stomach starts to go, and you think, man, especially if there's something back home and you start thinking about that meal. Well, that's kind of what the disciples were thinking about this time. And they're thinking, these people need to eat. And I'm thinking in the back of their mind, they're thinking, and we need to rest. So if you could send them home, that would be great. And Jesus answers, you give them something to eat. And the Greek emphasis on the you. You give 
them something to eat. Now, imagine yourself in the disciples' shoes right now. You give them something to eat. It's like, uh, okay. No, I, we don't have anything to feed them. Okay. If we were to go to a nearby town, first of all, how would we buy all of it? And it would take three quarters of a year worth of wages just to do it. So now they're scrambling. And they're doing the math. How much would this cost? They're doing the logis logistics. Da -da 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 -da. Okay, we're supposed to do this, but we don't have the resources. So he says, how many loaves do you have? Well, they hadn't checked that yet. How many loaves do you have? So they go and, and they scrounge about for a while, and they he says, go and see. So, okay. We have to take an evaluation of what we've got to start with. And when they found out, they said, five loaves and two fish. And by the way, this is one of the miracles of Jesus that is repeated in the other Gospels. In fact, it is the only miracle of Jesus that is recorded, recorded in all four Gospels. It's the only one. And this miracle of Jesus is repeated six times in the Gospels, more than any other single miracle, and repetition means important, right? So the meaning of this miracle is extremely important for all of us who follow Jesus, extremely important. As I've taught before, Jesus' miracles always teach a truth about God and His kingdom. So as we see the, the thing revealed in the miracle, there's a spiritual lesson that goes with it. Uh, a miracle performed by Jesus is an object lesson to us in some ways, and it's an acted out parable for us to understand how God works in the world. So it's extremely important we understand the meaning behind the miracle. So he sends them out, they come back, they say, five loaves, two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups in the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking five loaves and two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up the twelve baskets full of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of men who had eaten was five thousand. I think this would stick in their mind. Okay. So what does it teach? What does it teach? Well, firstly, I think oftentimes when we are stuck in our own head and we come to confronting <coughs> big problems, we are moved to an action. Somebody else has to do something because I can't. It reminds me of some committees that I've worked with. Def one definition of a committee that I've heard of, a, a committee is a group of people who do nothing, who discuss the problem and decide that nothing can be done. Well, this committee of 12 comes to Jesus and says, hey, we've got a big problem here and we can't do anything about it, so you do something. Send them away. That was their solution. Now, Jesus presents a different direction. So in this miracle, we find the disciples are crippled with inaction, and Jesus calls them back into action. And their, their action starts with saying, take an inventory of what you've got. And when they took the inventory of what they got, what they had at their disposal, they failed to count Jesus. Friends, God asks us to do some hard things. It's not easy to share your faith to a family member who has rejected Christ, because what if they reject you? There's risk, right? God calls us to do things that are hard, but remember, Jesus is with you. He was right there. They didn't count and say, we've got, we've got five and two. What can you do with it? He, he basically took it and he said, now I'm going to, because he wanted to give them a lesson. So, a basic lesson in spirituality. Begin with what you've got and leave the rest to God. Depend on it. Begin with what you've got. Do with what you have. Don't say, well, I can only do this much because many times, I've seen so many times, 
when, when believers come together and say, we've got this much, and they give it to God, God does these incredible things that makes our job run. So this principle is enforced today as well. And when we give things to Him, He blesses it and multiplies it. I want us to understand the two great meanings of this text. First, this text is a prophetic fulfillment of the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, and verse 15 and 18, it is told that there will come a day when there is a prophet who will come like Moses. Now, if there's a prophet that comes like Moses, he should be identifiable. Right? Look what Moses did. Moses came from God with God's word, and he taught the people. How many people did that? They went, they had a conversation with God, and they came back, and they gave teaching that was, that changed the shape of the country. Pretty awesome. But he also did incredible miracles. And when they were in the desert place, when they were in the wilderness, when they were in a solitary place like they are right now, the people cried out to God because they were hungry. Moses prayed to God, and God sent what from heaven? Man, he gave them bread. Now we know from reading the parallel text of this miracle in John, that in the book of John, Jesus, right after this happened, taught the disciples the truth that I am the bread of life. That I am the bread of heaven sent down from my Father. So we have this connectivity in this miracle that says that we are being fed by him. So this bread that is broken... <laughs> This Jesus, what did the disciples do with the bread that was broken? They distributed it. They distributed it. That's our job. We take what Jesus did and all of his power and we give them away. That's what we do. The work of a disciple is to distribute bread. The bread of heaven. Jesus. Because Jesus, when they recognize him, will recognize his voice and come to him and brought him to the fold. So, this prophetic text about Moses, coming that one coming like Moses in the future, is extremely important because this miracle fulfills that prophecy. Now, that's the, that's the on-the-surface thing. And sometimes we look at a miracle and we stop at the wow factor. Wow. You know, because... When we see a miracle, it puts us in a state of awe. And we think, that's incredible. He was powerful. But always know that there's more than the power there. There's a demonstration of a truth that we're to receive. And that is that we are bread distributors. Now, what moves us to distribute bread? Understand that people are hungry. The disciples saw that there's a hungry crowd. So, we have to cultivate a compassion for people. And I, I know some of you have gone to church many years, and when you go to church many years, it's, it's a true thing that we surround ourselves with people that think like us. It's easy that way to talk with people that already, already agree with us about, about politics, about, about faith, about sports. We have a tendency to migrate to people who agree with us. But we go past people all the time who are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And God has given us the bread which he has broken, his son, to distribute to people so that they could be saved. This is our job. This is our task. And so this week, my, I would like to challenge you, first of all, to listen to Jesus' voice, come away with me. A solitary place by yourself and rest. Because some of you really, really need it. You need some rest. And pursue that rest so that you get it. Have you ever been with somebody that's gone a long time without rest? What are some of their personality traits when you go a long time without rest? What demands are placed on you and over and over again? Maybe Maybe, let's say, relatives come from out of town, and your house is filled with people, 
and between going back and forth to the store to get groceries and keep the meals going and all that stuff that's going on after about four days, you're like... <sighs> and, and when your relatives aren't looking, you, you take out your internal countenance that's hidden to your relatives on your, on your spouse or your children. It's like, I told you to do this now! I need some help here! <laughs> Our countenance is ruined when we don't get rest. Our vision gets clouded when we don't get rest. Instead of seeing people that need Jesus, we see an inconvenience. I don't have time for this. Like the parable of the Good Samaritan. We kind of get in our own cone of, of thinking and we don't see people the way that Jesus sees people. So my closing prayer is this, that we would be given eyes like Jesus. And the, the thing is, when you go away, to a solitary place alone with Jesus, that's exactly what you get. You get refreshed. You get refilled. And you begin to see the world like Jesus again. You, you hear the word as he speaks it to you. And you get refreshed. And you get filled back up and ready to be poured out with you again. Please join me in a word of prayer. Let's stand together.
giving the gift of eternal life. If you imagine your mind, what it would be like if you had a tremendous amount of money. How much fun it would be to give it away. Make this person smile, pay their bill, imagine the response of them. That would be awesome. Imagine what it would be like if you had the cure to cancer. How wonderful it would be to go to Mary Lambert's house and to give that and have it happen. Wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't you be willing to go to that person and give that away if someone gave you the money, if somebody gave you the cure? What we've been given by the Lord Jesus Christ is more powerful than both combined. So we need to be people of compassion Givers liberally of that which we've been given that we didn't even have to buy. We didn't even have to work for it. He's given it to us. So as you leave this place today as ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ, as apostles, Mark uses in this text the word apostle. It's the only time in the entire book of Mark the word apostle is used. Do you know what it means? Sent ones. Sent ones. In following Jesus as disciples, we are also sent. So this day I send you in the name of Jesus Christ, empowered by that very name to share Him, the bread of life, with people who are in desperate need of Him. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.